Alright then, let's get into it. You ain't so tough with that bad boy tuck. I'ma get it how I'm living, I'ma walk the walk. Outline my lines, I rap through thought. Yo people, what's happening? Welcome back to Football Therapy with me, your host, Jan. Hope you're doing well, really do hope that. Welcome back to Chelsea News. In today's video... Where the ruddy heck is Christopher Nkunku? Man City play 120 minutes plus penalties with very little rest time before they play Chelsea. David Ornstein reiterates what the Chelsea owner's plans are. And we'll go over the Neil Barnett outburst in Pochettino's press conference. I appreciate all of you that come here to hang out at Football Therapy, so thanks for that. If you want to support the content, super easy. Like, comment, subscribe. Hey, share? Takes a millisecond of your life and energy. Just move your thumb slightly. Come on. Come on. And it helps me out. So thank you for doing that. And let's get into today's video. Let's start off with this press conference nonsense then. It happened a couple of days ago, of course, or after the Chelsea victory over Everton, 6-0. I didn't talk about it because I thought it was a bunch of nonsense, but because it's been percolating in the atmosphere since, I will reference it. What happened was after the penalty incident, everyone was talking about that. To be fair, Pochettino brought up kind of himself at the beginning of the press conference. And towards the end, Pochettino you know, made a relatively throwaway comment of sort of like, you know, we'll talk about football one day, this is all, all we did to talk about that incident. And Neil Barnett, former announcer at Chelsea Football Club, had an outburst, took uh, offence to it, I guess, and uh, said an expletive towards, I don't think it was Pochettino, I think it was his press officer. Still, he said it was a poor management of a press conference but with a swear word in there. And it caused a little bit of an argument on the way out. I think he might have since been banned by Chelsea uh, press conferences, which makes sense because you can't behave like that in a press conference room. It was trending on Twitter that it was Matt Law. Matt Law has since come out defending himself, saying, no, it wasn't me. I do feel kind of bad for Matt. I think this was a trolling session from Twitter users that perhaps don't like his recent coverage of Chelsea Football Club. That's my speculation. So everyone was tagging him and saying it was him. It's the internet. That's what people do. Anyway, it's a whole bunch of nothing. Stuff happens and press conferences. Maybe they're more sanitized these days because they're so meticulously covered, recorded on multiple devices and cameras and put on every form of social media so perhaps everyone behaves more. Anyway, that's enough of that. Let's move on. A la Madrid! Real Madrid knocked out Manchester City in the Champions League yesterday and of course Tommy Tuchel showing that he's still got something left in his managerial locker, knocking out Arsenal from the Champions League, who seemingly still don't have that European juice. If you want my reaction to the Arsenal elimination from <laughs> the Champions League, I of course made a video on it on my second channel, Football Yannick, where I upload nearly daily content of non-Chelsea football stuff. So yeah, Football Yannick on YouTube if you want to check that out and uh, watch my reaction to Arsenal getting eliminated from the Champions League at the hands of Bayern Munich. But what's more relevant to Chelsea at the moment is the fact how Manchester City not only just played in this midweek, but they played 120 minutes and then to penalties and then lost on penalties at home to Real Madrid. It probably would have been better if it was away because they'd have to travel as well. But, you know, that's more rest for Chelsea and it'd be interesting to see where their heads are now. It could go two ways. They could rally them and they absolutely batter us and they think, well, we can't win the Champions League. Let's try and win the double yeah. FA Cup and the Premier League. Or maybe they just like hone all their energy into the Premier League now. I, f I don't know. I have a feeling they're probably going to coming strong but regardless I think it's a good thing for Chelsea emotionally drained uh, physiologically drained like energy gone we had much more preparation time and the last game we played was a 6-0 win at home not an elimination from a competition at home so that bodes well for Chelsea and also it just shows you as well Bayern and Real Madrid they've got that sort of aura in the Champions League. Heck, we've got a little bit as well with our multiple European Cups. We do have twice as many as Manchester City. Don't let anyone forget it. So let me know what you think. Comment down below. Do you think we've got a good chance of beating Manchester City? I think probably tomorrow I'll do a match preview of this game. But just generally, it was, it was exciting to watch both those games yesterday. And I think it is a good thing for us that uh, they've obviously played way more minutes. They're going to be emotionally drained. And uh, yeah, less recovery time. Double thumbs up from Jan. That sounds really cynical. They're going to feel horrible, sad and drained. 
I'm happy. I want to be that guy. I'm happy for Chelsea. Before we talk about the Chelsea ownership and some quotes from David Ornstein, I want to pose the question to you. Where is Christopher Nkunku? So here's a segment of Football.London today talking about Christopher Nkunku and his injury. Here's that sentence again, continuing to undergo his rehabilitation program. <clears throat> that sentence triggers me so much from the Chelsea injury list segment on the website. The 26-year-old forward has been out for most of the season and he's currently out of a hamstring injury. Pochettino said this, I don't know how far away he is. Still, we don't know if he will play again this season. To return in terms of training, I don't know. At the moment, we do not know when it's possible to start training with the team. At the moment, he's not training with us. A lot of at the moments here. The setback didn't happen. I have no information about that. He is recovering and he's been longer than we expected. That was after the final. He played 30 or 40 minutes. The problem we didn't know and we found out after the game. God, this is cryptic, Pochettino. This type of circumstance, it affects a lot of things. Too many players have suffered this season. I hope we can be involved again soon. Blah, 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 blah. Possible return date next season. Where is Christopher Nkunku? We know Lavia got injured in training in pre-season, out for the whole season, came back for 30 minutes just to remind us that he was alive, out for the rest of the season. Leslie Ugachuk was out. We know Reese James is out. We know Wesley Fafana had a big injury and will be out for a long time. But Christopher Nkunku, we never really learned what was going on. I mean, he was injured after we signed him, or agreed to sign him when he was still at Leipzig. We cursed, bro. Like, what's going on? What is happening? Players get injured just because they think about joining Chelsea. They'll just then magically get injured because they have an idea of signing for Chelsea. It's just mental, bro. Look, let's, like, pump the brakes a little bit. Obviously, it's not as bad as it could be because we've got an absolute sensation named Cole Palmer. And maybe if Nkunku wasn't the team, Palmer wouldn't be shining as much as he is because Nkunku, although he's direct, he still would have an element of a free role, I think, in that number 10 on the left, maybe having heavy influence. But still, we want to see Nkunku play with Cole Palmer. They might be able to, like, have great interchanging patterns of play and it's all very exciting and fun. As we forget, Nkunku is a lethal finisher. He's one of the best goal scorers in Europe. Genuinely. <sighs> So Pochettino planned his attacking strategy around this player. Understandably, he's like the senior superstar attacker of the team. He is, trust me, I know we've all forgotten about him, but he's very, very good. <laughs> but then throughout the season, we learned to score goals and we score quite a decent amount of goals now. The problem is at the other end. So because of that, you know, we're not really thinking about it much, but it is so weird. Like Pochettino, when asked about Nkunku, he's like, I don't know, what's happening here? Who's that guy? It just puts more and more and more pressure and scrutiny on the medical team to the fact where the manager just doesn't know. They're like, oh yeah, you know you're super... I know Cole Palmer's the superstar now, but he is meant to be the superstar. You're su I mean, you know, Lavier's this young player. He got injured in training and was sort of out for a long time anyway, and we knew it was a big problem. But the fact how, like, the way they're talking about Nkunku, like, I don't know... <laughs> It's just crazy, man. I feel like it's wild. I'm still very excited to see him. Of course, it was Eden Hazard in uh, that interview of John Obi Mikel on his podcast. He says that his son's a massive Chelsea fan, sleeps in an Nkunku uh, Chelsea shirt, just waiting for him to come into this uh, Chelsea side. Like, I know it doesn't really carry any weight anymore, especially because Cole Palmer's card's like 65 rated, but Christopher Nkunku is the highest rated Chelsea player on the FIFA game. Does anyone care about that? Look man, I'm excited, he is in his prime. I want to see him play. I do hope we see him play before the end of the season. Like there was talk about Wesley Fafana returning before the end of the season, but look, I'm not expecting Fafana. I'm not expecting the Uga Chukwu. Of course I'm not expecting Lavia. There was some expectation that Reese will come back. He did a recent post on his Instagram saying, yeah, yeah, look, it's all good, I'm gonna come back. I'm, I'm excited, don't forget about me kind of thing. Although I'm not sure we'd see him train on the grass. I wonder if there's been more setbacks with Reese James. Of course, Chilwell's back, but yeah, and Kunku's a weird one, bro. Let me know what you think. Comment down below. Because, um, you know, at the moment, we could see him play on the left, maybe, instead of Mudrick or Sterling. I do want to hear your thoughts. Leave them down in the comment section below. And let's move on. David Ornstein for NBC Sports Soccer says this. Chelsea's ownership know they must do better and expectations are higher. They do not want any excuses and are adamant that despite the public noise, they'll get it right at Chelsea. Well, there's been a lot of public noise. Loads and loads of football pundits, 
podcasts, YouTube channels, radio station hosts, social media accounts from every corner of the earth, giving them an immense amount of heat and largely deservedly because, you know, they made mistakes. We've been mid-table. I've been very, very uh, stern on my position that I like a lot of their ideas because I've always called for this kind of stuff that they do in terms of infrastructure uh, and wage structure and, you know, investment into perhaps more young and developing players. For me, that's just intelligent stuff. But you still have to do it right and you have to play well and you have to not be mid-table in the middle of April. But the story could change. Cole Palmer's helping that, of course. I saw, was it Simon Jordan, who's recently flip-flops all over the place on TalkSport when it comes to Chelsea, and says, look, if Chelsea finish sixth, which we can do, like, I mean, we could easily finish 11th as well. Like, nothing would shock me anymore. But we could finish sixth, and should we finish sixth, and obviously reach the cup final against Liverpool, one that, yes, granted, we probably should have won, and had we had more senior players there, we would have probably seen it over the line and capitalised off that momentum that we had in that final. Whatever, it's in the past now, but, you know, semi-final at Wembley. But, you know, another trip to Wembley in the FA Cup semi-final. I mean, just there, if we go sixth, final, semi-final... That shows certainly progress from 12th last season and no finals. <laughs> but, you know, like I said at the beginning of the video, we could even do something against Manchester City at the moment, depending on how exhausted they are. But the owners, obviously we have to speak about them because they're a massively recurring theme in the Chelsea news media. And what do we do here on the channel? We reflect on the Chelsea news media. The talking points. When they say they want to get it right, what is getting it right? That is the question, because of course they do not want to align themselves to the old stewardship of Chelsea and how Abramovich ran things. Um, they understand Chelsea are about winning, do they? But the way Roman ran the club has become untenable in the modern footballing age. But what is... Yeah, what is success? What is getting it right? Just being a top six team and how, you know, aggressively competitive it is now if the Saudis manage to put more money into Newcastle, if Arsenal stay good, if Ineos do bits with, you know, Manchester United and put more money into the squad and, you know, so what, if you just sort of constantly stay around in and around the top six and always playing in Europe, you know, don't have a season out of Europe, you fluctuate between the Champions League and Europa League and every now and again getting into a title race, like every few years you're in a title race, because that's about right, isn't it? Because like, the amount of title rate, we won, we won five Premier Leagues in either side, I didn't say it's Abramovich left and started, so 2004 to 2021, let's say, or 2022, nearly 20 years, we won five Premier Leagues, so what's that? One every four years? Yeah. <laughs> and But in between, we'd like finish third, fourth, fifth, sixth, fourth, you know, obviously one season tenth. No more tenths, no more twelves. Always in floating around the top six, I guess. And that's becoming harder and harder and harder in how competitive the Premier League is. Because remember, the Premier League now is way different to what it was in 2004 in terms of, you know, how good your Brentfords and your Brightons are now, do you know what I mean? And, and you know, people like Iriola making Bournemouth really good and getting like, big results. Like, it's way, way stronger than it's ever been. The great, like, really, really amazing managers are going to, like, the bottom of the Premier League teams now. So it's way more competitive than it used to be, which makes it, unless you're, like, Guardiola or Man City, it makes it harder. But even Liverpool, they've had, like, they've jumped around a little bit in their golden era with Cop. They've won one Premier League and one Champions League. So I want to put it out to you guys, what is getting it right at Chelsea? What is like end game here? Do you think we can reach what Man City are doing? I think without Guardiola, who I think is the best coach in the world, and his infrastructure that migrated from Barcelona, I don't think you can emulate that. You know, probably going to win four Premier Leagues in a row. Um, what's it, like six of the last seven or something like that, just just in some, maybe even more. I can't even remember anymore, just insane numbers from Pep Guardiola. I don't think that's a realistic target for Chelsea, it's especially for all the money Chelsea have. We're not a state-backed project. And lest we forget, people, 115 charges remain on Man City's head for the way they've been navigating and negotiating their football club in the Premier League. So, I mean, I think, even though it's allegedly, there's been a lot of evidence through the Der Spiegel stuff as well, that essentially there's been, the you know, the 
the books have been cooked, as it were. So if Chelsea are genuinely and legitimately, like they are constantly stating, they're going to do things by the books and by the law. They're going to try and bend the rules with, like, the amortisation contracts and stuff, but they're never going to break the rules, and they're always going to self-report, you know, financial irregularities to, like, UEFA, FA and Premier League. They're going to basically be law-abiding owners. I think it's very, very difficult to emulate what Man City have done. So what, what is getting it right? Tell me down in the comment section below, start up the conversation, and I'll be very keen to learn what we all think. All right then, thank you for joining me, and I uh, hope to see you guys back here very soon. Peace.